Well, welcome everybody to Rook Storage for Kubernetes. Uh, I'm impressed to see this many of you here late on a Friday afternoon. So congratulations, storage must be important to you. Uh, yes. <laughs> Great. So I'm Travis Nielsen. Uh, I'm with the IBM storage team. With the team, we were at Red Hat. We moved over to IBM a couple years ago. But ultimately, uh, one of the original Rook maintainers, creators of, of the project, and happy to talk about Rook and Ceph today uh, and all about what we're doing with it. So, Blaine? Yeah, I'm Blaine Gardner. I'm also an engineer on the IBM's uh, Data Foundation storage team. Uh, I've been working with the Rook project for seven years, a maintainer for, I think, around six. Hi, I'm Annette Kluwit, and uh, I was introduced to Rook by Travis about seven years ago. And uh, I've been a believer ever since and work also on the Data Foundation effort in the IBM storage team. All right, well, let's, let's dive in. Um, so today we want to go through an introduction. You know, what is Rook? What features does it have? Why would you use it for your storage platform? And get into some details, some interesting things around, well, what should you consider about in your topology when you're deploying? Uh, after you've deployed, what are some maintenance best practices? And then what does the project health and the community look like? Uh, we'll get into some new features for our latest release, 1.15, which was uh, a couple months ago. And then our roadmap and features we're, we're kind of working on for our next release, 1.16. To finish it off, we'll have a nice topic by Annette on application disaster recovery. So just to get an idea of who's in the audience here, uh, could you raise your hand if you're learning about Rook for the first time? Anybody? OK, we got a bunch. Great. Um, who's experimented with Rook? We've got a, a number. Who's running Rook in production? And also a bunch. And it, for the real diehards, who's going to Cephalicon next month in Geneva? OK, I'll, I'll be there. If you're there, I'd be happy to see you there. OK, so introduction to Rook. Um, going back to history, a uh, long time ago, even before Kubernetes was a big thing, uh, over eight years ago, I was with a team where we were looking at cloud native storage. We wanted to say, what, sh what really should storage look like? What do we want to take a bet on? And we saw that cloud providers, of course, have their storage platforms. But what about your own data center? What do you do for storage? Do you have to, you have to buy somebody else's appliance uh, and plug it into your data center? So storage, traditionally in that fashion, is not part of your cluster. You buy it, you plug it in. But why does it have to be external to, to Kubernetes? Why not manage storage as any other Kubernetes application so you can have similar maintenance um, patterns? So we said, OK, we're going to do this. We're going to have storage for Kubernetes. But what storage platform do we want to trust? What are we gonna, going to take a, a bet on? I was not with the, the Ceph team at the time, but we, we looked at Ceph. And I was not at the same company or anything, just looking at open source. We wanted a solution that was open source, that was enterprise ready, already running in production. We didn't want to go write a new storage platform. And we, after looking at Ceph, we decided, OK, th this, is, this is where we want to go. And I'll explain more about why that is uh, in the coming slides. So as we started creating Rook, so what is it? So it, it really brings Ceph storage into your Kubernetes cluster. Rook will manage the Ceph storage with an operator and, and CRDs. So you, can de so you define with your, the CRDs how you want to deploy storage in your cluster, and Rook will go make it happen. Rook will automate the deployment, configuration, all the upgrades to keep your data online and available even during upgrades. And then your applications will get to consume the storage just like any other um, storage with CSI, with storage classes, PVCs. There's a CSI driver to hook it all up. So it looks to your applications just like any other storage platform. Um, Rook is open source based on Apache 2.0. Um, and Ceph is also open source. So the entire stack, the storage platform, is open source. So now what is Ceph? And why did we take a bet on it? So Ceph is a distributed software-defined storage solution, and it really fits a lot of the Kubernetes paradigms where it's distributed, it needs to scale, it needs to be ready for enterprises. And Ceph, the advantages of Ceph, it's all-in-one open source platform. So we have Ceph RBD, uh, that gives us block storage, usually used with read-write-once volumes. You have Ceph FS, which gives you a shared file system, usually for read-write-many volumes. And then also, to top it off, object storage with Ceph RGW, the Rados Gateway. 
which gives you access to S3 buckets. Uh, the, yeah, the RGW is, um, is S3 compliant, and feature for feature, it, it keeps up with S3 pretty well. Uh, again, it's open source, and Ceph itself was first deployed in production and first stable in July 2012, so what are we, over 12 years now. One of the first big customers was CERN, which is where Cephalicon will be next month with running in their, you know, their collider, just terabytes and you know, terabytes of data. I'm not sure how many. I'm curious to look forward to, to see what they have to tell us next month on how big their data set really is. Uh, but again, Ceph is really designed for scalability. So ter there are many production clusters running multiple and many terabytes of data. So Ceph is designed for durability. So Ceph storage, when you put data in Ceph, it's consistent uh, as opposed to eventually consistent with some other storage platforms. So as soon as the storage acts that it's stored, it is stored and safe. The data is sharded by Ceph across AZs, racks, nodes. You can choose your failure domain and how you want Ceph to spread that data. Um, and we'll talk about what that means for resiliency a little bit later. So uh, even in extreme disasters, the data can be recovered manually as well. In addition to the replication mode, erasure coding is also supported by Ceph. It's most, most commonly used for object storage. Uh, but it also works with block and shared file system uh, where performance isn't as critical. So just to kind of understand how the pieces are, are fitting together here. So Rook, again, is the operator that really deploys and, and manages Ceph. So Ceph, uh, for those of you who, who know it well, it's not known for its simple management. It is a, a rather complex storage system. So from the start, Rook's goal was to make Ceph as simple as possible. It may not be the simplest still, but, but we do our best and we make it so you can deploy and have, have hope to manage Ceph. Uh, the CS, there's a CSI driver then that helps your applications provision and mount the storage into your, your application pods. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the core data layer is Ceph uh, providing that direct storage at that layer. So, so how do you install Rook? How do you get started? There are Helm charts. Uh, there are, or if you'd like to, to work with YAML directly, there are just example manifests for many different configurations. There's a quick start guide. Go to our website, rook.io, and, and get started. So where would you install Rook? Where would you, really it's wherever you need storage, which is wherever Kubernetes runs, right? Where, when we started the project, we thought, well, we want to run storage in, the most common scenario in your own data center because there is no other storage option. Uh, but ultimately, we'll see there are cloud scenarios too, even to, to enhance the cloud provider storage. But ultimately, it can be in the cloud on-prem, you know, virtual bare metal hardware, any off-the-shelf commodity hardware, Ceph is designed to work with. Uh, the, and the underlying storage, so we basically take local storage or um, or cloud volumes, even loopback devices for testing, we take those individual devices and aggre Ceph aggregates them for, for the storage platform. So now, why would we deploy Rook in the cloud? Well, their cloud providers have certain limitations that, that make, it, make certain scenarios difficult. For example, um, storage not being available across AZs, or the number of PVs per node is limited to 32, I don't know if that's still the number, but there's some limit typically. Uh, or if you have small PVs, they have poor performance. So Ceph helps you, and Rook helps you overcome these by, you put Ceph on top of, um, off, on top of your cloud storage. You can have virtually unlimited PVs. You can have the data avail available across AZs, so your, your applications can be rescheduled across AZs, no problem. Um, and again, and if you provision Rook with the, these larger PVs under the covers, you'll get the performance benefits of, of the larger PVs, even if you have hundreds or thousands of smaller PVs on top of it. And, and, it, and it is a consistent storage platform then if you worked with multi multiple clouds, you could have similar support across them. So a bit about you know, how to consider uh, do I need dedicated nodes? Do I need a dedicated environment? How do I do this? Is it really safe to run it with my applications in the same cluster? I, I know I've heard lots of comments like, is that a good idea or not? Well, by default, we have our hyperconverged mode, which does, um, where it, 
you say, okay, just run it in the same cluster. It runs on the same nodes with your applications. And you can set resource requests and limits on, on the Rook and, and Ceph pods. So, and also on your applications so that each of them get, get their, the resources that they, that they need. And as long as everybody has resources set, really they can run together and, and it works well in, you know, in all the scenarios I've heard of where things are properly configured like that. Uh, but in higher performance applications or where you really want to make sure there's never a chance the, the noisy neighbor problem with applications will affect your storage, uh, you, in the same Kubernetes cluster, well, just have some dedicated storage nodes. You can taint them so the applications don't run on them. And then you can tell Rook, okay, only run the, the Ceph storage on these dedicated storage nodes. And you can ensure the storage has absolute, absolutely dedicated resources to run there and never be imp impacted by applications. The third mode to consider is, well, what if I really don't want to run the storage platform in Kubernetes? That's great. It, it does have advantages for being separate, which is, uh, you can run the storage platform completely outside of Kubernetes. If you have like a raw Ceph cluster, you can manage it separately from Rook or, or Kubernetes. And that allows you to connect Kubernetes to it. And you can, you can even connect multiple Kubernetes clusters to the same storage uh, cluster. So here's a diagram of what that might look like for an external cluster. So in your Kubernetes cluster, really from Rook's perspective, all you have is the operator and the, that deploys the CSI driver and simplifies the, the CSI driver. And it's just a simple connection that then helps you connect to the external cl Ceph cluster with the same storage classes and PVCs and, and mechanisms that, that, you're already, that you're already familiar with. And again, you can connect multiple client clusters to this. And also, even though it's one Ceph cluster, you can isolate the storage so, to make it multi-tenant. So Ceph has mechanisms for making sure uh, that clients are isolated. They've got what they call Rados namespaces and, and some sub-volume groups, other concepts. So what does the CSI driver provide? Uh, so that whenever you provision a volume in Ceph, you get a thinly provisioned volume, meaning you, you can tell it a size and the size can, can grow. You can expand the volume. Uh, they're very dynamic that way. If, as the Ceph cluster runs low on space, you can add more storage to Ceph itself. The CSI driver is topology aware. So if, you're, if you have AZs, you can read the data from the nearest client. And then what you consider standard CSI behavior with snapshots and cloning, dealing with uh, provisioning ephemeral volumes. Uh, and another feature coming soon is group snapshots uh, or the ability to say, I want these volumes to be snapshotted at the same time. Along with CSI, we have some add-ons which are really more advanced features to, to help enhance those. Some of these features are for um, for DR and mirroring, which we'll, Annette will talk more about, uh, and some other things, reclaiming space, handling offline nodes, and yeah, volume replication. Another feature is, so with, with RWO and RWX volumes, block and file, you're used to provisioning them with the CSI driver, mounting it to your pod. Well, what about for the S3 endpoint when you're using object storage? There, Kubernetes doesn't have this pattern. Well, the if you're familiar with the Kazi effort, container object storage interface, that is an effort to, to define a standard way in Kubernetes of accessing buckets and provisioning them. Uh, so this is currently experimental. Rook has a full implementation. Um, and another way of doing it, which we've had for longer, is the object bucket claims, which is basically just way, a way of saying, I've got a storage class. Let me provision a bucket instead of the, the normal volume. And then you can have access to the, the bucket from your application pod. Another topic on uh, maintenance, things to consider as far as data resiliency and, well, I need to do upgrades. I need to upgrade the nodes of my Kubernetes cluster. How will that affect the storage if it's running in the same cluster? So if you know, we assume you have three, generally three um, failure domains, say they're AZs, any one of those three AZs can be taken down and all data remains available and for both reads and writes. So your cluster is online even while you're maintaining one entire AZ. 
We use PDBs, the pod disruption budgets, to ensure that the node drains are aware of what they can drain and what can't, can't be drained. If you try and drain a node that, has, that would make your storage unavailable, the PDB says, nope, you better, uh, you better hold off on that. Uh, the Rook upgrades ourselves. We do ensure only one failure domain is affected at a time to, to do our best for no downtime. And then kind of a, the worst case scenario, if disaster hits, you power loss to, uh, to everything you have running. If the entire cluster goes down, just, be, be, just know that data is safe as long as you can bring up at least one of those uh, failure domains back. So because the, the data is replicated to each each failure domain. Just bring one of them back. You don't need all three. You can get the data back. And kubectl plugin, troubleshooting and maintenance does require things that don't really fit the CRD pattern very well, but you need one-off um, status, tell me the status, do this one-off operation, remove OSDs, uh, do things with Monquorum, some of these advanced operations. We do have this kubectl plugin that uh, helps with those scenarios. And we'd love feedback in this area too. What would you like to see automated that are manual tasks today? And now I'll turn the time over to Blaine. Yeah, I'm Blaine and I'd love to talk to you about our community. So, I mean, being an open source project, our community is really important to us. Um, I think out of all the stuff on this slide, the thing that I'm and we're most excited, excited about is um, having a new contributing company stepping in. So uh, Kleiso um, is, ha has really been contributing some development uh, lately, and it, it, it's been really fantastic having them. Um, in addition to the three companies that have been involved for a while helping with uh, uh, maintainership as well. Uh, Rook is a graduated project. We've been graduated for four years now. Um, and Rook declared itself stable six years ago uh, in 2018. Um, that stability is and, and has been our number one focus. Uh, so we have, I, I could not even tell you how many upstream users running in production. Um, and, you know, downstream from a corporate sense, we have tons and tons of downstream deployments that are all running very successfully. Um, we've had users come up and talk to us at the Rook booth and some of the anecdotes that I think are, are really amazing are we have people telling us that their Rook cl clusters run great on NVMe with InfiniBand or just some spare old desktops with 100 USB drives. <laughs> uh, we try to release about every six months. Uh, our last release was in August. Our next release is going to be in uh, just next month in December. And we try to have regular patch updates just so whatever is the latest we have going on, everyone can get those every two weeks. And we do put those out uh, more urgently if there is need. Um, uh, for those project updates in the latest, in the most recent release, 1.15, uh, we officially welcome support for Ceph's uh, latest version named Squid. And we also have some just kind of quality of life improvements around uh, day two uh, disk parameter changes. Uh, and we actually uh, had some communi community members, I'm sorry, contribute uh, Keystone and Swift integration. Um, so this is primarily beneficial for those running OpenStack, especially if you're trying to run OpenStack's like control plane in Kubernetes. Uh, we've also begun uh, experimenting with uh, kind of pulling out the CSI uh, operations out of Rook itself into its own operator so that we can hopefully give people better flexibility around what they're doing uh, with Rook and with CSI. Um, if you're a Multis user, uh, I don't expect too many of you, uh, but we've had some feedback about uh, just like maintenance challenges ongoing with upgrades around uh, what we've called holder pods. Uh, so we began the deprecation process for those um, and we're also beginning some work in 1.15 on uh, object store pool placements. Um, looking forward to the next release and next releases, uh, I think the overall theme that we're seeing is kind of starting to see interest in and 
desired support for users with more complex needs. They really do want to like get back some of the complexity of uh, Ceph's like just infinite configurability. Um, one of the things we have specifically on the docket is uh, mirroring for Rados block pool namespaces. Um, so this is something that like can tie into disaster recovery efforts. Um, and we're seeing a lot more interest in and push behind object storage. Um, so two of the many things going on with object storage are support for S3 storage classes. Those are distinct from Kubernetes storage classes. Um, so don't get tripped up there like we all do. Um, and also adding more uh, auditing and logging for S3 accesses. So as administrators, you can keep track of what users are doing with S3. Uh, the holder pods I mentioned will be fully deprecated, probably with 116. And uh, also uh, Ceph's two releases back, V19, Quincy is nearing the end of its life, so we'll be stopping support for that. Uh, but now I, I'm really excited to pass it off to Annette. Thank you, Blaine. Okay, so what I want to do um, is sort of show you how Rook and Ceph can integrate into an actual uh, solution. And the solution we want to talk about is disaster recovery at an application level. So the first thing is to um, discuss sort of the measurements of disaster recovery. So we have the um, recovery point objective and we have the recovery time objective. So the recovery point objective is how much data can I afford to lose if this application uh, goes down? So that is usually measured in time. So you might say my, you know, I mean, there is a case for RPO equal to zero, uh, and that can be designed, but there's a lot of limitations. So um, recovery time objective, even if RPO is equal to zero, meaning you don't lose any data, it's still gonna take time unless you have a highly available application to recover that application. So in terms of how Rook and, and Ceph support, um, and I'm gonna speak about asynchronous replication, um, Ceph just out of the box already does synchronous replication, but what I'm talking about here is asynchronous replication between peer cl Kubernetes clusters. So we have a couple CRDs that Ceph offers that Rook uh, orchestrates and um, keeps track of. We have the Ceph RBD mirror. This is going to create a daemon that is used to do the replication on a volume level, usually. And then we can, we're going to, uh, in cube objects, these CRDs now are available, which are volume replication and volume replication class. So the volume replication, what it does is it will go ahead, instead of you having to go into Ceph and do the Ceph commands, to enable a volume for mirroring or an image for mirroring, you're going to instead use a volume replication. So there'll be a volume replication um, resource for every volume that the application is using. And these are for block volumes. So the volume replication class is going to specify the replication interval. So you might you know, have a, a five minute interval of which you're going to replicate the delta data for each image. We also have Ceph uh, file system mirroring, and it's, it's similar. Um, by default, uh, it is not enabled. Um, so, and it doesn't currently have any, any cube resources like the volume replication that enable it. But um, you can in Ceph configure it, and this is all documented in the Rook documentation. Similar to block volumes, you have a Ceph file system mirror. And um, you know, there's, there's quite a few steps right now to set the bootstrapping up, but once you get the mirroring there, then you, know, you can go ahead and start um, replicating file volumes. This is experimental, so uh, we don't, you know, like I said, it's fully documented. You're certainly welcome to try it. Downstream, we have not um, introduced this into downstream yet. We have a different way of replicating file volumes using uh, vol sync right now, downstream. So once you've got your, your replication set up, you've got your replication interval, then you're ready um, to basically apply a policy and be able to do a failover or a failback. 
The difference between a failover and a failback is a failover assumes that one of your Kubernetes clusters, or at least the application on that cluster, is no longer accessible. You know, you don't know if it's running, but you cannot get to it. It doesn't appear to be running. So that's when you're going to issue a, um, basically use a, a volume replication group um, to go ahead and initiate that failover. It's going to demote the storage. Well, actually, in a failover, it won't demote because it can't talk to it. But it's going to promote the image that's sitting on the alternate cluster to be primary. And remember, that image has been updated based on the replication interval. So it's sitting there waiting to become primary. You're on the failed back. This is a situation where you want to just move the application to another cluster, maybe to move it after a disaster or after you had a failover. In this case, both clusters are healthy. And you're going to scale down the application before. So then your RPO is going to be equal to 0, because all the writes will be replicated before you fail the application, or before you migrate the application. So when we want to sort of orchestrate this and make it a little bit easier than doing Ceph commands or even um, you know, doing like volume replication, um, there's some we can use some combination of projects. So one of them that we've integrated with definitely downstream, but also um, we have an upstream capability to do this is open cluster management. If you've heard downstream, it's called advanced cluster management on OpenShift. But upstream, um, this allows you to import the, the peer clusters and to orchestrate, be able to deploy applications and it also is integrated with the project of the team I work on in the data foundation um, development team, which is ROM and DR. So if you don't remember, um, you know, a lot of this, that's OK. But if you want to look at, just look up uh, ROM and DR GitHub. And um, a lot of what I've said will, will be documented there, um, in addition to the Rook docs, which also are very good. So, the Raman CRDs that are, that are new and come with the Raman project are DR policy, DR clusters, DR placement control. So these are all be, are, would be all in a, what we call a hub cluster, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, DR policy is going to apply a policy on a per application level. DR and the policy is going to include what are the two peer clusters and what is the replication interval. The DR clusters are which Two clusters are paired. Right now, we do everything in pairs of two. And the DR placement control is going to be used to say, what DR action do I want to do? Um, we use two actions, failover and relocate. Relocate is failback. So the VRG, the Volume Replication Group, is a, a custom resource that as soon as you create a DRPC and apply a policy, then the VRG is on the managed cluster or the cluster that has the application. And it's going to then basically do the actions to, to initiate that failover or relocate. And then, like I said, if you there's the upstream project for ROM and DR that you can easily find. So if we look at it just um, in terms of you know, an architecture or how it looks, uh, in the middle, we have a, so this is a three Kubernetes cluster solution. In the middle, we have what we call the hub cluster. That's where OCM would be deployed. It's also where we would have our DR operators. So we have, you know, that would create the, the um, custom resources I discussed, DR policy, DR clusters, DR placement control. They would all live on the hub. And the reason they live on the hub is we can't assume that, that a cluster is going to be available where the application is. So I show the replication, the asynchronous replication going both directions. Remember, this is per application, not per cluster. So you don't have to have a cluster just sitting there doing nothing. You can do a blue-green kind of thing where some of your applications are primary on one and some of them are primary on the other. That way, if you lose one, then you only have to fail over the ones that are down. 
And in terms of distance limitations with asynchronous, you don't really have a distance limitation um, compared to a synchronous like Ceph that we spoke about before. Um, but if you know if your if your latency is high, er, then your replication takes longer per per volume. So this is how it would look um, if you take the components we've talked about today, Raman, um, Rooksef, and then the CSI. Uh, like I said, it does require a hub um, cluster. There are solutions where you can put, if you only have two sites, you can put a hub, an active hub on one side and a passive hub on the other side. And then, you know, it's still a four, that would be a four Kubernetes cluster solution. So you don't necessarily have to have three sites, but um, in terms of what I'm showing you here, this is like a three site. The, the object store in the middle um, really is living on, there's object store, uh, a bucket on each one of the clusters. And what we do is we store metadata to be able to, and in some cases cube objects, um, to be able to recreate the app on the alternate cluster. So there'll be a bucket on each one that sort of you know cross saves, assuming that but you know if, if both clusters go down, then obviously you don't have a failover. You just have a lot of down applications. Um, oh yeah, I missed that. So we, the team I'm on, I'm a dev team for for these DR solution downstream, um, but upstream we do almost all of our development upstream, and we have a tool which has been developed called DRENV so that we can quickly create using OCM, um, ROM and DR, um, Rook and Ceph and OC, and I said OCM. Anyway, it creates the whole thing I showed you here and it allows you to uh, go ahead and test failover with essentially just running it on a machine, a single machine and using Minikube. So at the bottom there um, is a link to that user guide to set that up if you want to try it. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Just in conclusion, uh, please go to our website, rook.io. Uh, from there, you'll see a link to the documentation, all the documentation that helps you get started, troubleshoot, set it up, everything. Uh, join our Slack. There's a link from the website as well to join the Slack. Uh, you know, we, we love questions through Slack, whether you, or we have GitHub discussions, GitHub issues you can open whenever you find things you'd, you'd like to improve. Um, anyway, hoping for your feedback, we, we do really strive to put upstream first, that, and we've grown and appreciate the community, so thank you for all of your involvement, for those who are already involved, and looking forward to working with more, more of you. So I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk, it was excellent. Um, my question is whether or not you can use Rook as a control plane for multiple external um, Ceph clusters. Um, so how would you see, or, or, or maybe you could maybe describe the pattern that you would use for managing multiple you know, Ceph, uh, Rook and like Rook operators and, and, and Ceph clusters across say like multiple regions, hundreds uh, of clusters, thank you. Right, so, so you're saying you have multiple Ceph clusters and you want to manage it with, with one Rook or you've got one Kubernetes right, yeah. cluster? Yeah, or do you that's have... right. Or, 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 if you, or, if you, or if there is a pattern for managing multiple Ceph clusters with Rook, um, right. what, what, what would that look like? Right, so Rook does have the ability to manage multiple Ceph clusters in the same, uh, same Kubernetes cluster if you really want to super isolation from you know, this Ceph cluster for these applications and this Ceph cluster for those applications. I'd say it, it manages a handful of Ceph clusters well at the same time. It's just the op, Rook operator does not manage them in parallel, so there, there can be bottlenecks if you try and do too many of those, but there's, uh, we, we have a design consideration uh, where we'll, we'll separate, make, make that more parallel to handle that better. Um, but yeah, does that answer the question or anything to add, anybody? Um, I, I guess if, if you're considering um, Standalone Ceph clusters. Uh, that may be a question that you want to ask, like the Ceph ADM team from the Ceph community as well. Um, they may have some, like, fun like ideas about what or how to do that. I will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next question. Uh, I have two questions. So, first question regarding the uh, replication performance. So, 
looks like uh, there must be some overhead to support the replication across uh, clusters. Do you mind to give a kind of some guidance regarding what, what, what resource we need to reserve for replication support? I'm not sure. I heard it. I'm not sure. Understand the question. Maybe we could talk after. Um, okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Then that, that question. So in order to support, uh, you have hub uh, cluster. You also have two, AKS cluster. So in the case of region outage and uh, failover to cross region, does it require the three cluster in three different region? or what's the recommendation to yeah. deploy these three clusters? Yeah, um, the, the, I think the question is if I have a hub cluster and two managed clusters, do they need to be in three distinct locations? And the answer is yes, um, because if you lose the hub and you have a fail, if you co-locate two of them, right, the hub and the managed cluster and you have a failure, you have no way to fail over the other ones because your hub is not available. You can, like I said, have four Kubernetes clusters, two at one site, two at the other. In that case, you have two hubs, active, passive. And if you have a failure of site one, you recover the hub at site two, and then you can fail over the applications that are, are on site one. So, so in, in that case, is there any kind of recommendation to support, to make the hub cluster itself resident in the third region? Because there's no mention on that, but that seems like a kind of key uh, coordinator. So that should be some consonants um, applied to that hub for uh, like uh, residency uh, or failover within that region, right? It cannot be standalone single cluster. Think, think, think about that cluster is in well, I, I one see cluster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you assume that the, that the hub could go down, you can run the managed clusters with the applications headless and recover the hub. That's not, I mean, you can do that. You just won't be able to install any new apps using uh, OCM. But I think the more serious thing is losing a cluster with applications. And if you believe the hub, you want the hub to be resilient, then you would do an active passive hub uh, situation. Okay. I, hopefully I answered the question. Yeah. And we can talk okay. more. Yeah, we can talk more. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I think we're officially out of time, but feel free to come up and ask questions as well. And, yeah, and thank you yeah. for your time. Thank you.